Welcome to Adapt and Clay Thank you for deciding to watch this video. I'm doing a series related to neurology questions. I think most of this content is very difficult, but if you get a concept, the answer questions to answer questions will be easy. So look at the way I'm going to approach these questions. Um, stop the video, answer them yourself, and then try to follow through and see if you, you're getting the point taken care of. The problem is you have to follow the concept. Follow the concept when it came to neurology. Let's get to it. First question, as usual, reading from the back. I'll be straightforward, very fast, but giving you the key facts. Reading from the back. Is a select or apply, okay? Which of the following findings will indicate the presence of what? Autonomic dysreflexia. Do you know what autonomic dysreflexia is? That's the key aspect, that's the buzzword. And then she's assessing your client for complication after a spinal cord injury. You have a spinal cord injury, now you develop autonomic dysreflexia. This usually happens when you have injury above T6. What do you see? Some of the and symptoms is related to ICP. They don't have flaccid paralysis. The flaccid paralysis is associated with the spinal cord, not autonomic dysreflexia. You see why how they would they would they would distract you and trap you. The question say autonomic dysreflexia, pounding headache like ICP increase. Usually your blood pressure is going to go up. Hypertension and bradycardia like ICP. You're going to have profuse sweating above the level. So if this is T6, above T6, you'll be sweating. And you have bradycardia, like cushionoid triad, and you have severe hypertension. So you see, keyword, you can answer the question. If you know the content, the answer choice will pop out like a candy. This is what I use for my on demand. If you subscribe, you get more of this. Uh, is a Q bank, mini Q bank that I have with some short explanation. A client with spinal cord injury at T6 is experiencing a pounding headache, hypertension, and diaphoresis. I just want to see if you get a concept. That's why I had this question. But you don't need to memorize. They can set this question multiple times. Now the question is asking you which next action is a priority. Therefore, which one should you prioritize? That means all these answer choices are correct and they are good, but they are not a priority. You have to be sharp. When you're picking an answer, you want to be sharp. And when you be sharp, you're picking something that will solve the problem and take the patient out of their condition. If you have one second, what do you want to do? Lower the head of the bed, give the patient some anti hypertensive check for fecal impaction, and then give the medication for the headache. Why do they develop this? Pounding headache, hypertension, diaphoresis, buzzword T6. This is autonomic dysreflexia. What happened? Excessive stimulation. From what? Either on the skin, in the bladder, or in the rectum. Remove constrictive clothing. Check your bladder and make sure it's not distended. If it's distended, put the foley in. Then what? Check the rectum and see if there's two there disimpacted. The first thing you do, you elevate them before you do all these things. Based on answers, key concept, you know that the right answer is check for that. I can say this question in several ways. So don't memorize the answer, but just pay attention to the buzzword. And then it's assessing a client with the presence of what? Brzezinski sign. Which of the following techniques is correct to demonstrate this sign? How do you know? Right? You have to know what it is. It's part of meningitis. There's only two things, okay? Two signs you should worry about, Brzezinski and Kenning sign. Therefore, you know meningitis is related to what? Some brain irritation. So the exam should irritate the brain, right? How does flexing your wrist irritate your brain? Even if you don't know, testing strategy, this is gone. Flexion of the wrist, it has nothing to do with the brain. Something that will stimulate the brain, it has to go through the spine, right? Observe facial twitching after tapping the cheek. I tap your cheek. It has nothing to do with your brain. Therefore, you live with this too. Ask the client to touch their chin to the chest and observe for involuntary hip and what? Knee flexion because the spine is irritated. Or asking the client to keep knee and hip at 90 degrees while on their back 
and slowly extend one of the knee. Key bad weight. The difference you can tell from Brzezinski and Kenny, look at the last one. There's a bunch of knees going on. The exams begin with your knee, right? But for Brzezinski, the exams hand with the knee. That's the key word. If you begin with your knee, you're a Kenny side, right? But if you hand with the knee, you are Brzezinski's. So Brzezinski sign. So that's the key strategy. If you know it, you can use any strategy, but the key fact is how to answer question. That's all. And as you're teaching the client with newly diagnosed Parkinson's disease, which of the following the nurse should emphasize as the cardinal features of the disease? Cardinal features, that means key features. You know, Parkinson, the cardinal features are what? Resting tremor, uh, Muscle rigidity and bradykinesia, slow movement, right? Intentional tremor is when you try to move and you have tremor. We all have it, intentional tremor, right? But resting tremor is when you are rest and your hand is shaking. That is classic for Parkinson. They don't have vision problem. Of course, they will fall because of the tremor, but that's not the hallmark associated with that concept. The client presents with this sudden onset of what? Right-sided hemiplegia and aphasia. Every time somebody comes in with the stroke and you have aphasia problem, is probably from the left side. And what? A left-sided hemiplegia. That's saying you cannot move the what? The right side. No, right-sided hemiplegia. If you can't move the right side, that means your left side of your brain is affected and you have aphasia. The next assessment reveal what? Loss of vision, right? In the same field, field of view of both eyes. Which of the following complication is most likely? Keyword, assessment reveal vision loss in both field of view. Which one is consistent with that? Even if you don't know what they're talking about, right? The stroke is on the right left side of the brain. Therefore, if I see left-sided weak neglect, I would say no. If you have stroke on your left side, you're going to have right-sided neglect. So this is gone. Your ability to recognize face is mostly on the right side, okay, of your brain. Same thing as apraxia. But the question is talking about vision, both eyes. Even if you don't know, I look at it and I say, oh, homo, napsi, Eminopia, oh, this sounds like a vision issue. Yeah, this is the problem. You're going to lose vision, uh, your, your vision in a field of view for both eyes. And that is what we call it. Uh, that condition, this is the condition. And this is caring for a client with stroke. And it, expressive aphasia, I can't express myself. That is a area. We do the following intervention is most appropriate to enhance communication in the client. Once again, I keep on saying, read the question from the bar, go for the buzzword, then connect it together. Which of the following intervention is most appropriate to enhance communication? Something that will enhance communication. What is the problem? Expressive aphasia. What is the problem with the expressive aphasia? I cannot express myself, but I know what to say. But I can hear you, right? Therefore, give me questions that I will be able to answer in the simple form, right? Sp speaking slowly and loudly, I can hear you. It does not help with that. I can't express myself. Writing it down is not a good communication. Provide detailed instruction is too much for them. They can't express themselves. Yes and no is the best way to talk to them. So providing yes or no questions, they will be able to say yes, no. They want to express themselves. They don't want to write things down. You don't need to have to give them detailed instruction about anything. And let's care for a client with seizure disorder on phenotype therapy, which lab results the next you monitor to assess for complication related to the medication. A bunch of weight, forget about it, read it from the back. He said, which of this will help with the complication and phenotype? This is the two things. You have to know most medications, okay, bind to protein. And the protein is albumin. 
less level of albumin will cause phenotype to float around. Therefore, we got to check your albumin level to make sure we keeping the phenotype level in right place. So every time they give you a medication, always think about albumin. So more nutrition can affect it. If you have liver disease, it can affect how much phenotype is floating and that can become toxic. So that's the hard one. This is also a hard one. But I just want to give you content. A client, some content you may not know. A client with what Jenneberry syndrome is experiencing progressive paralysis. Okay, what is the problem? We do the following laboratory findings should the nurse suspect to confirm diagnosis. If they give you this case in the case form, always the best way to confirm Jenneberry syndrome is, I know we all know, ascending paralysis. But the best way to do that is through lumbar puncture. You do lumbar puncture. And you look into the CSF, cerebrospinal fluid. What are you looking for? This is the one of the diseases where there is a dissociation between protein and cells. When you look into the cerebrospinal fluid, there's a bunch of protein, but there's no cells there. So there's not going to be red cell. There's not going to be white cell. There's going to be to be basophil. It's all going to be protein. You see the concept you use. If you know, you spend time, come up with the answer you think it should be, and then you look at the answers, it will be there waiting for you and pop out like a candy. Okay. The client is being evaluated with possible diagnosis of what? Myasthenia crisis. Myasthenia crisis. Okay. Myasthenia crisis. Which of the following findings should the nurse suspect is myasthenia crisis? Go back to the basswood and concept. You know myasthenia gravis problem is acetylcholine receptors um, binding by autoimmune, and therefore they get weaker throughout the day. It's a muscle problem. You need to give them more acetylcholine. When you go into crisis, it's excessive symptoms. That means most profound form of muscle weakness, what, which organ always you need to pay attention to it as a muscle. If you paralyze it, you are in trouble. It's respiratory problem. So that is the key. At the same time, any of these uh, neurological problems always come back to respiratory problem. Even Parkinson's disease, worry about the lung. Antitin disease, worry about the lung. Myasthenia gravis, worry about the lung. ALS, worry about the lung. GBS, worry about the lung. Repetition is the key. Pay attention. And the last question. And this is assessing a client with a head injury and observes the following. Heart rate is 55. Bra pressure 200 over 70. Irregular respiration. Which condition the nurse uh, should suspect? Look at it. You have a head injury. And your blood pressure, you bradycardia, you hypertensive, you have irregular breathing. Look at this. Your systolic, minus your diastolic is 130. This is too much. It's a wide, we call it pulse pressure. So the presence of bradycardia, hypertension, irregular breathing, change stroke breathing, wide pulse pressure is consistent with Cushing triad. That means you're about to hang it. Uh, can you break this? Spinal shock is uh, uh, happy right after you have a uh, spinal injury. Mostly facility, facility, you have a flaccid lower extremities and a loss of function. Neurogenic, neurogenic shock usually happen when you have injury to your spine and you have what? Bradycardia, right? You have bradycardia and hypotension, not bradycardia and hypertension. Right, and autonomic dysplasia is like ICP, right? Even though it sounds like that, right? Bradycardia, hypertension, they don't have irregular breathing, they have uh, uh, diaphoresis. So that's not the right answer. So Cushing is the key. So these are 10 quick questions for you. This is adapting class. Thank you for watching. If you want more, you can join our membership or just subscribe to YouTube and then join our YouTube family. You'll never regret. Or you can join our crash course on demand. 